Right, everyone, welcome to a new show, The Jumper Punch, with two icons of the fancom world. Myself, Pommy, you know me, and I've got Big Rocker. How are you doing, Rocker? Good, mate. Yourself, good. Uh, this is uh, great. Excited about this, The Jumper Punch. We're going to uh, go over some stuff here, and uh, we're going to have a bit of fun here. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, let's, let's uh, get it. Oh, before we do... I like to thank the people out there first of all because I got voted as the Blue Abroad, you know, like uh, biggest fan can, you know. And look, it's been tough, you know, for me, you know, like after parties, interviews, you know. So it's <laughs> been a tough time for me. But and before Dan Andrews gets on to me, when I say after parties, I mean I'm having a wine by myself in the lounge room, right? So don't come after me with no fines, man. So anyway, guys, as Jeff Fenix said, man, love yous, man. Thanks for uh, voting me. And, yeah, and really excited about this, Tommy, man. Love uh, love doing this with you now. Oh, well, I mean, we've, we've, we've probably talked about 20 hours, haven't we, in the last <laughs> week or so? I mean, there's, there's probably it. some of our best conversations are off air. So it. it's good it. to get some. It. And some of it should never be on air, I reckon. Yeah, 100%. Uh, to be fair, most people who watch this know me that 90% of the things I say shouldn't be on air. So That's it. That's I, it. I've created a level of expectation. That's what it's all about, That's levels it. of expectation. So I reckon we get we get to the – we go to the line and we just try to get as far close to the line as possible and not go over it. So, yeah, let's do it. Well, in my 35 years of experience, I've noticed that if you push the line, there is actually no line. That's it. it. it, it it's in your head. That's it. How far can you push it? How far can you push it? Exactly right. Well, so talking push about it. pushing it, the first subject we've got on the agenda is 2020. How, yes. how have you seen 2020 from a Carlton perspective? Where do you sit? Look up. We've discussed this before, you know, on the fan cam. I think it's a failure as 2020 went as far as because we started at one level, you know, and then halfway through the year, you know, like the goalposts shift. And from that point onwards, I think we failed. We collapsed. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened, if it was mentally, players, but I think we failed, say, halfway through the year. Well, I, th I think in professional sport for me, I I'm the same in life. I think goals change. You know, yeah. I, th I think they always used to say to me, my golf coach, goals should be set in sand, not stone. And I, I agree with that. I think that at the start of the year, I would have bit your hand off for where we finished. Straight away. Do you know what Straight I mean? Because away. based on where we've been, that would have been a huge improvement. But I think when I look at like round eight, and up to round eight, it, it looked like we could beat anyone. We'd rolled Geelong at that stage. Yep. We'd yep. put Essendon to the sword. Yep. Things were looking like this was a team that was building into something spectacular. And then you have, like, St. Kilda. They were flying. The benchmark was there that someone could come from nowhere. And I felt like the end of the season for me was kind of a little bit like old Carlton. It yeah. was it was almost like we we got got there. The corner was there, but suddenly the GPS had broken and we'd lost the corner again. And it felt a little bit damp. Hundred percent, man. It just felt like we shit our pants, man. We, we we could see the lie, you know. And you look at it; those last four games before that, everyone was talking about how they were all win winnable games. We should have bet Collingwood. We should have bet. Um, Adelaide especially, you know, and we shit our pants with all of them, with all of them. And that just shows the mindset on the, in the team, you know. They didn't believe they could do it. They probably they probably uh, fell into that height that was around by everybody, you know what I mean? Like, and as much as you should be not talking about finals, I think you should also be, uh, I don't understand why the team doesn't say, right, we're playing finals, man. Like, why aren't we? I think their mindset, oh, let's not talk about finals and that. I think that affected them maybe a little bit, you know? Yeah, sometimes I do think, I think even as fans as well, I noticed a huge change in the season. Like, we know what I'm like. From round one, I'm promising you finals and flags. 
I, I get really into it. But my belief is way strong. And I started to notice fans started to believe as well, which to me was a magical moment for me because usually when I'm coming out here saying top four, I'm getting loads of abuse. And then suddenly I started to see people believing. And it, it, it sometimes feels like for me, I listened to Stewie Jew round one and they were saying, what was the expectations? And he was talking finals football. And you could hear the media kind of giggle when he answered like that guy. Yep. Yeah, good one, mate. But to me, that should be the benchmark. Like, if I'm a coach, I'm telling these guys they're the best side in the comp. 100%. I agree with you 100%. I don't get what, what, what is this thing about, oh, let's not, you know, let's not go too far. Let's just worry about one game at a time. I know that's what you've got to do internally, of course, you know, one quarter at a time, one possession at a time. I understand all that, right? But what's wrong with saying, what do we want to do this year, man? I want to win the grand final. I want to win the grand final next year. Are we capable? Oh, if we're capable. What do you, why aren't we capable? Why aren't we the Muhammad Ali of the competition? Say, mate, I'm coming out. And if you fail, so be it. You take it on the chin, right? And you move on to the next level, man. But you go in there and you say that I want to be top four next year. I think we're capable of being top four. And I bet you the mindset will change, man. Like, there should be nothing wrong with that. I, I, I'm with you there. I, I do think as well, when I look at the messaging of the club, sometimes it does feel like there always is a cop-out. It reminds me of, you, you see parents like that at school as well. You know, like they kind of give an expectation to the kid, but there's definitely a safety blanket. Yep. And it always feels like, for me personally, the wording of the club always has that safety blanket. Yep. You know, like It was like, like we had Bolton two years ago say we can't be distracted by winning. This year we had Teague saying that our main motivator can't be finals. Yep. And that, that always worries me because, to me, I wanted a bit of pressure on the Collingwood game, especially yep. the GWS game. We'd failed once. This was our chance of redemption and... Yep. results went our way and suddenly we were back in the finals hunt. I kind of wanted Teague to come out and say they they failed last week. This week it's all on the line. This okay. week heroes are made. And, you know, maybe a Churchill-type speech in the locker room, you know, today you can join Williams, Kuafides, the big names. You can be a hero today because that's where finals are made. In finals, a hero's made. Look at Dusty, you know, like he's, you know, like look what he's done. Listen, man, I agree with you 100%, man. I, I just don't understand, man, how their mentality is sometimes. So um, um, if we just, if we just quickly go to like the Richmond now, right? Let's just, I just want to talk like we've seen the grand final. So good on Richmond. I'm, I'm happy for them. I think what they've built is, is amazing, their dynasty, man. And that's what we should be looking at, right? But just, Quietly, um, I just Brendan Gale ten years ago. Now I know it's been in the media lately about what he said and that, right? And I remember because one of my best mates is Richmond, and we've talked. And at the start of that year, of when they won the premiership, my mate was ready to sack everybody. You know, he wanted to get rid of uh, Reval before Martin. He could get good value for what's the coach doing there? You know, all the normal stuff. But when Brendan come out. Uh, he said the three finals, and then he said three grand finals by 2020, zero debt, and they laughed at him, right? And they laughed at him. They said, because Richmond had done nothing, right? But he stood by his ground, and he said this. He goes, it all starts with a vision, because I watched, I watched it again. He said, it all starts with a vision. And then he said, we're not here just to compete. We have a vision, and we want to be the best on the ground and off the ground. And then he said, and if we've not locked into that, we might as well pack up and go home. That, that's beautiful. That is beautiful, man. Now, he said himself, a guy, man, if he failed, so what, man? He walks away and that's it. No big deal. But, man, look at this, man. They've set themselves the goal and they've achieved it. But if you set yourself a goal as, oh, let's win seven games, how can you possibly win the ever if that's what you've achieved? But if you say, I'm going to win the grand final, man, 
you know, what's the chance that you're going to make the eight? You know what I mean? Because the eight isn't going to be good enough anymore. There's an old saying, man, you, you, you reach for the stars and you might get to the moon. You know what I mean? So what's wrong with them coming out and going, mate, we've, mate, I think we're good enough and I think we're ready. Let's do what Richmond did, man. Let's get this plan out there and let's everyone go towards it. Oh, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I always think, you know, the reach for the stars, you'll hit the moon. Like, I remember that being plastered in primary schools up and down England. That was it. I remember going to a sports psychologist when I played sport, and I remember him saying to me, do you ever think it's weird that when you're a kid and you ask a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's always something exciting. It's be a surgeon, it's be an astronaut, it's be a lawyer, it's be the prime minister, it's be someone, be someone yeah. special. And he was like, but then he says, when you get to 15 and they start talking about jobs, you get normal jobs all of a sudden. Oh, I want to be like my dad. I want to be the store manager at Coles. I want to be a banker. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And he says, it's how, you know, the anticipation of greatness and what you can achieve decreases as you get older. And yeah. he used to say to me, what were your aims? And I used to have like really crap aims as a golfer. I used to say, oh, I just want to make money. Um, <laughs> That's a crap one. <laughs> and I remember he sat me down and said to me, he was like, well, you've got to ask yourself, do you want to play or do you want to teach? Because he was like, every time I ask you about teaching, I used to say, I want to coach a kid like me and make him world number one. I want him to love the game. And he said, all your dreams and aspirations for coaching are, are massive, but playing yourself, it's just get by. And yep. that is why right. you get by, because you've set your mental's target to get by and be mediocre. And it's like what I said to my kids, if you aspire to be average, you'll end up being mediocre. Like, exactly. aspire for greatness. Exactly, man. And that's what I've been saying, man. And lately, it's just been... And I think it's a lot to do with, uh, with people in positions and their jobs. Like, a coach is worried about his job. Right? He's worried that he's not going to be there in three years. So if he says, no, we're going to win the premiership, right, and he doesn't, you failed and we're going to sack you, you know. But if he says, oh, look, you know, we're going to win. We're going to try to win eight or ten games. Like what he's doing is he's securing his job there. And unfortunately, I believe that hurts the team. That hurts the team. Why can't we be, mate, you've got to be, You've got to be willing to fail. I'm telling you, man, in life and in sport, you're going to fail on a whole lot more than you're going to win, man. You know what I mean? So be, um, how do you say, it? like accept the failure, like look for the failure, you know what I mean? And then maybe we can succeed. And, you know, like I hope that's what happens. I hope that's what's happening. And I hope that next year they, you know, like I don't care if they say we, we want to win the, the grand final and they don't. I don't care, man, but at least we, we gave it a, a red-hot crack at it, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I always think the messaging is more like, for me, not just the coach. I actually think from the top of the tree, like you hear, like this year, all we heard about for me at the start of the year was how many members had signed up on the back of an abject 2018 to now 2019. It's increased because we showed a bit. Eddie Betts has come. That's increased our membership. And... Um, and that kind of leads me on to the next subject as well, Sossgate. We heard Soss say Eddie Betts was signed more as a marketing ploy than it was on field. And that kind of transcends to what you were just saying. Sometimes I think the messaging of the club, and we heard Brendan Gale there, he said on the field and off the field success. I sometimes feel like we're bred for off field success first, where to me in sport, they're sisters. If you're of successful course. on the field, everyone wants to be your sponsor. Everyone wants to come to you. I know three or four oh. Richmond fans who are big Richmond fans, but they didn't sign up to membership until they won in 2017 because, I quote, they were sick of losing. They were yep. sick of going to see the games and get get beat. They were, they'd given up. They still loved them, but they'd given up. And that leads me on to it. Where do you think... Sossy's interview, what did that say to you, Sossy's interview? Listen, I've been hearing the comments about Soss, right? And 
let me say one thing about sauce. First of all, I see sauce as two people, right? They're sauce the player. And let's not forget sauce the player. Right? I love sauce the player. Right? He was Carlton through and through, man. And just, you know, like two-time premiership player, 312 games. Um, full well, full back of the century for crying out loud, man. If I was full back of the century, I'd be walking around with a big S on my chest, man. Like, <laughs> no, one can, no one can take that position off him until next century, you know, like. He was great, and he loved it. He loved the, he loved the, um, he loved the team. Just remember, like in the '95 series with Sauce, man. Do you know he in the whole final series they kicked one goal on him, one goal on him. Gary Ablett kicked zero on the grand final day, man. The bloke was a beast. I love him. But then we get to the recruiter. You know, and as the recruiter, first of all, with the interview, I think it was a bit of sour grapes. He's come out and he's, it was a bit of sour grapes. I didn't like that about him. I, it, there was no need to do it. Just let's move on. You know what I mean? Um, as the recruiter, look, man, I, I'm, this might be controversy. I reckon he failed pretty badly as a recruiter. And he deserved what he got at the end, you know what I mean? And now he's come out and he's, it's a bit of sour grapes, man. It's like, I think you said something to me about it's like a girlfriend. What did you say? Like that? Oh, it's, it's a bit like interviewing my ex girlfriend about me. Like, you know, the size, length, and duration will change. But like, I, I mean, I'm with you there. Like, for me, I, I understand. Like, for me, I, I'm the worst fan in the world. I don't get sentimental about our ex-players. For me, what happened round one is forgotten about. It's always look to the future. I don't think yeah. I don't think it's healthy to look at 95. I don't think it's useful to look at Judd's time. I think it's the relative near history. So the year just gone and the year ahead is where I try and live. Yeah. I don't feel as a football club you ever owe anyone anything either. Like to me, it's the club that makes the player, not the player that makes the club. Hundred percent. And it's all about the jumper, man. It's all and about. To the me, jumper. Soss is so talented. If he was at Collingwood, North Melbourne, he would have yeah. been a superstar there. It, it happened to be that the stars aligned, father son. We we get that lineage through our club. So yeah. to me, I, I I agree he has a right to reply, and I think that whether it's sour grapes or whether it's scorned. For me, the situation at the time was messy. The fact it was reported in the papers, I didn't really like his sons brought into it. For me, when we made that club statement, I thought that was a warning sign because the sons are still there. And I thought, for me, I thought that was a bad PR. I thought, I agreed with Sauce when he said that, that he felt that that was amateur. I thought it was amateur at the time because they're still there. They still have to turn up to work every week. And you're basically saying your dad has left because of you, yep. which isn't good. And I, I think he has a right to reply. The thing I questioned about it and what hurt me was this is the two weeks before the trade period. Yep. And this year has been beautiful in the press because aside from Kane Corns going mental and thinking Sam Walsh isn't a good footballer, we've had pretty positive feedback in the press. Yep. The, the feedback has the Blues are coming again. The Blues are back. The Blues are building something. Yep. For me, if I was a player, it would be nice to read the papers and see everyone thinks we're in the right way all of a sudden. Where yep. two years ago, they were saying the rebuilds failed, the players are garbage. I'd yep. imagine this year has been a happy place if you're a player, but there's not yep. many yep. negative articles. And I did question Sauce. I think he's got the right to say what he believes, and I believe he believes what he said. I don't think it's for show. I think he actually believes that's how it went down. Yep. So I, I question why now for me. And and I, I would have rather him said that in December. Yes, exactly, man. Wait till this is over and then have your say. You know what I mean? Because like that thing, I mean, the whole draft, the whole draft would have been finished. We know what's happening with with uh, with uh, Bob. Oh, Bob. I, I call JSOS Bob because I think JSOS is stupid. So I like to call him the brother of Ben, you know, but now <laughs> Ben's not there anymore. But that's anyway, a great name. <laughs> Bob, that's it. 
Uh, so I, I thought later on would have been nicer. Like, he's still got his son there, so it's going to make it difficult for him. We don't know what's going to happen to him. Look, look what he said. And looks, yeah, it's a bit of sour grapes. But you're right. He's got the right to, to say whatever he wants to say. But he could have waited. If he really did love the club, which I'm sure he does, then he knew that this wasn't going to be great for the club. I don't think it's going to hurt us too much, but it's definitely not going to help us. So let's just wait, man. Like, let's wait till later on. But yeah, I think the media definitely timed it properly. They know what's going on. And this is all about them. They knew they get sauce just on trade time. Man, we can get him talking. SEN gets the whole ratings going. It's all beautiful for them. They don't care what happens to the club. So. I- I, I felt it was very scripted, and I felt like Gary and Watto, they really did push it as well, didn't they? Like, for me, when I heard he was coming on and they introduced him, it's Stephen Silvani, Gary started calling him sausage. It was all friendly, friendly. He was going to give his opinion on trades and what goes down, an insider's view, and then straight off the bat, what happens at Carlton? And I was like, come on. Wasn't the interview supposed to go for like 10 minutes and it went on for like half an hour? Oh, G- Gary was milking the hell out of that. He, loved, tell you. he loved it. He loved He loved milking stuff, man. You know, Gary. But yeah, so yeah, the sauce thing was... Uh, but I don't think it's going to hurt us too much. It's really already forgotten about in a way. Have you? You know, it oh. hasn't really been talked about anymore. You know, so I, I think it's not going to hurt us too much. And, yeah, yeah, I don't think it's going to hurt us too much. You know? I think, for me, what makes me sad, two things. I mean, one thing impressed me. I'm a big advocate of our media is horrible. But I thought the fact that the next day they just announced Tom de Koning had signed, yeah. I thought yeah. that was very smart. Just ignore yeah. it. Give yeah. the fans something positive. Yeah. I thought that was clever. But I think what disappointed me in it, really was it's obvious something has happened in the back room of the club that probably jeopardized last year's trade period to to an alarming state i would say i would say that if we look at it now when we look back at that i think that papley deal i think the butler miss i think the ellis miss i think that says to me that we've maybe made the right decision because it was obvious from that interview and Carlton's statement in the year when we did part ways that something wasn't working. And and to me, I think that's what's sad for me, that obviously it couldn't work. And yeah. there is something, I don't buy into romance. We know that I'm not the most romantic sport person, but there would have been something romantic that Sauce was there and he was part of the last flag and he also built the next flag. And I, I think he, I hope when we do win the flag, the club shows humility and thanks him because whether we think he's got it right all the time or totally wrong, 90% of the players that will play in the next grand final are probably going to be recruited by Soss and his team. So I hope there is an article there from the club thanking Soss and he is involved because whether we so. like it or not, I don't think he's got everything right. I do think when I look back at it, some of the players that have come through the club have blagged my head, absolutely melaned it. There's, oh. a few. There's quietly, uh, look, it, of course, it, it, it was there for what, like five or six years. So he's definitely got some things right. You know, he, he, he couldn't have got everything wrong. I think a lot of the things he got right, again, this is going to be controversy, but I think a lot of things he got right, man, I could have got my dog to get it right. You know, it was number one draft picks, Walsh. Weedering, anyone could have done that. It's the later ones, it's the ones I question, the ones from GWS, you know, like if I remember correctly, there's like nine players he got from GWS, right? And man, at the end of the day, we've got one player playing, and that's Plowman. March Bank is still a question mark. Everyone talks about March Bank. We don't know what he's gonna do, and we don't know if he's even gonna like recover from his injury. So at standing today, there is one pick from GWS out of nine. That's big, man. And we're talking people like, we've discussed this, uh, Palmer, 
Um, who else was it? Was it uh, Palmer? There was uh, Sumner. Remember Sumner? Like, he lasted like a season, you know. Uh, Jet Lamb. Um, Gorridge. He admits himself he was one of the worst top 10 picks ever, you know. Like, so I don't know, man. Like, I, I thought there was a lot of misses there that, that shouldn't have happened, man. And, and people might say, oh, they're later picks. They're later picks. So it really doesn't matter, you know. I don't know. They do, man. They matter at the end of the day. I, I, I do think there's a lot with Sauce. Like, we've got Dow, we've got O'Brien as well, we've got yeah. Cunningham. There's a lot of wait and sees. There's no doubt that O'Brien, Cunningham and Dow, for me, all fall in the same category. Their potential and their best is very good. Yeah. But for me, it's consistency as well. Like, yeah. you look at Richmond, we've discussed them. Their players' consistency, their worst is average. Yep. Like, Dustin right. Martin, I was talking to a mate who's Richmond, and I was taking the piss out of him because all year he's been saying... Dusty hasn't been the usual good self. He hasn't been at a high. Do you know what I mean? I, I hope he's okay. What's going on with him? And then all of a sudden, finals comes out and he just kills it. Right. And, and I, I was thinking, as he was saying to me, oh, I'm a bit disappointed in Dusty this year. I was thinking, fuck, I'd take Dusty. Fuck, <laughs> disappointed. Gee, man. What a... Yeah, he, he does it when he has to with Dusty, you know. He just does it when he has to, you know. And that's an... Oh, yeah, we can talk about Dusty. Oh, just quickly on Dusty. Man, in 17, man, he, they were after him big time, man. They were after him. North Melbourne, I think, was after They are going to offer him, I don't know, $8.9 million a year for like 500 years, you know. And he said no. He said no, and he stayed with the club, man, for a little bit less money. And look what he's achieved, you know. So I hope, I hope, you know, like players in our side, see that too, you know what I mean? That to build this dynasty, we're gonna have to like stick together and not worry about the pockets so much, you know. So let's hope. Oh, 100 percent I think like that moves us on to our final subject, the future. I think for yeah. me, when I look at Richmond, what they've done exceptionally well is they've built a list. They yeah. haven't built a best 22, they've built a best 30. They've they've gone bigger than the 22. You know when we look at our 22 and we're like, oh, we need an inside midfielder, we need this, we need that. Uh, with the exception of Tom Lynch, they've they've really built players that bolster the list, that yes. create competition. Like when they get an injury, the fact they can just throw a Macintosh, uh, yep. Jay Carts, a Higgins, just whoever yep. it is, and he just does a role straight away. Mate, and you've you, you've said the, the the right word there, the role. They've got roles. So it doesn't matter who plays it, you play a role. Where we rely on the individual players, right? We oh if Cribs gets, you know, like if Cribs can't play, that's it, we're fucked. You know what I mean? But we shouldn't be thinking that. We should have players ready to play that role. And that's exactly what they've done, Richmond, man. They just I do think 2020 is kind of Cripps injury, I actually see as a good thing because we started to see players step up in Cripper's absence. And I think uh, if you look at the Brownlow polls, every year pretty much Cripper has been head and shoulders above everyone else. And this year to see Sam Walsh push him close, to see Ed Kerner thereabouts, and then players that didn't get the kudos, Setfield has been brilliant. Gibbons has stepped up. Yeah. I think this year, for me, when I go back through the games, what has been a positive is I could make an argument for three or four blokes every game to be in the top three. Yeah. Where last year it was Patrick Cripps guaranteed. Yeah. Then Sam Walsh would be a guaranteed two or three. Yeah. And it would be throw a dart at a third name. This year, what has impressed me, and I suppose this encompasses all previous categories, that the team has started to look like a team where before it was almost like a 1970s disco group of Patrick Cripps and the random 21 blokes. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Now, 100%, man. And look, as much as like I'm hard on the side of that, I definitely see there was improvement in the side, you know, and definitely a lot of players stepped up. We weren't relying on Cripps as much as we bagged Cripps. 
a little bit because we expect so much from him, you know. The other players and those players you mentioned, they're 100%, man. They've, they've stepped up and it makes our side look a lot better, you know. It's starting to take that responsibility, you know, especially people like you said, like Walsh. Walsh is a gun. Man, I can't. Uh, I love the bloke. Walsh is just a gun, you know. But the others have stepped up. Like Centerfield has really stepped up this year. He's impressed me, you know what I mean. And Gibbons, you know, now they're playing him in the right position. So I think he, you know, he's got a lot better too. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. What you said is 100%, man. And I, I do think, as a club, that's where we need to be. Because for the last two years, the amount of... I, I know we shouldn't listen to them, but I've got a lot of moronic Collingwood mates. And they're always like, stop Crip, stop Carlton, one man band. And I think this year, it's good that these players have started to come out of Cripper's shadow, have started to back him up. And it leads me on to Charlie Kerno as well. For me... Charlie Turner must have been watching that all year and thinking, Jesus, they're entering inside 50 in a game more than I've ever seen in my career. Like, get me out there. Like, 100%, man. He's going to be hanging out to get out there, man, yeah. And to me, if that's true, that Cripp has had the injury they said since round 12, like, and his numbers post round 12 were pretty good. They're above yeah. AFL average. That says to me, as a list, we're in a pretty good position because... Full strength Cripper, we know what he can do. And Charlie Kerner, we know what he can do with, let's be honest, crap service. His yeah. service was horrendous for the majority of his career. And he, and he looked like a superstar. So imagine if he gets good service, that boy, what he's going to end up doing. 100%. And that's what excites me, I think, moving forward, that then you're going to bring Williams into this. Bad looks as close to a lock as possible. Suddenly, that best 22 does look very appealing on paper. Oh, 100%, man. Like, I'm, I'm loving that Sars coming, you know, like, man, he's worth every cent, man. That, that running half back, the way he breaks those lines, um, the way he delivers. Like, to tell you the truth, I didn't know he was so accurate until you gave out the stats. That he, is he something like 80% or something in, in his father's rules? Is he... Yeah, he's very high. Um, but anyway, like his disposal, can you imagine him running, breaking those lines, hitting targets? And then you've got Williams coming in, who's going to help bolster midfield, that strong midfielder, wants to play midfielder. And then you've got Kerno up the front, that X factor alongside Harry. I mean, things are looking, things are looking good, man. Like, I am optimistic. I'm, I'm pretty excited. You know, I just checked it as well. You're spot on, 81% disposal efficiency. Hey, tell you what, someone listens to me. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. But, but no, it does excite me. I think, like, you think as well, one of the good things is when you look at Richmond, I think if you look at their rebuild, when they've lost a player, they've replaced it with someone who's his equal or superior. And I think you look at Cade Simpson, if you actually look at the heat maps of Adam Sard and Cade Simpson the last three years... They're yeah. identical. Nice. So, nice. And we're basically getting Kid Simpson in his pomp. Yes. So it's almost like we're knocking Kid Simpson out of our team, yeah. but we've got a time machine and we've gone back 10 years and we've got a faster version of Kid Simpson. Yeah. And that's what top teams do. Yeah. They, they recycle talent. We look at GWS, Hawthorne. For years, they've done that. Lost a player miraculously a player comes in who's equal, if not better. Geelong, they're another side, you know, do it. Oh, De Geelong are one of them teams that just stays old, aren't they? Like, they, they, they lose a 38-year-old and sign a 30-year-old and it just keeps yeah, that age it. back in. That's it, that's it. exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah like, exactly. I don't think that team's got younger or older for a decade. Nah, and they're always up there saying, so, I mean, yeah, they're always up there. They've won their premiership. So, yeah, no, nah, definitely right up there. Look, the way I look at this too is I look, forget about your top top end. Everyone's got six or seven A graders and they've got another six or seven B graders or, you know, C plus graders. It's your bottom six, you know. And when I look at Carl's bottom six, no, they're not very good, you know what I mean? When you look at Richmond's bottom six, I mean, they probably slot into our side, you know? Our bottom six has a lot to work with. So the day when we look at that bottom six and uh, they're, 
they're they're a good bottom six and they could probably fit into another side. That's when I think we will be getting somewhere, you know. So at, like at the like we keep mentioning it, but you know, poor bloke. I mean, I bagged this bloke. The bloke's ears must be red, you know. But Paulson, when when he's in our bottom six, like we're in trouble. We are definitely in trouble, you know what I mean? And I oh, forget about that his name's Paulson. The caliber of Paulson, that caliber of player, if that's in our team, we're not going anywhere, man. And that's our problem. And that's why we need to bolster um these players. And some of these players you've been mentioning, like did you just say yesterday about the Collingwood player? Who was it? Uh Phillips. Tom Phillips. Yeah. So someone like that, you know what I mean? Like you could say he's probably better than our bottom six, but man, if he's playing in our side, side's looking a lot better, a lot better. I think that's what you want to do as well. I think for me, like you look at players that are linked with moves in 2020, you look at like Jai Colwell, like hardly played much for GWS, but instantly picked up by Essendon, rumoured to be 550 a year. That you can see there's talent there, and he's behind Stephen Canelio, Kelly, Taranto, Hopper. Like, you look at it and you think, that's what I always do when we're linked with a player. I'm thinking, well, why can't he play for that side? Like, what's wrong with him? And then when I look at GWS's midfield, I'm like, well, it's pretty good. That's right. That's right. That's do you right. know what I mean? But. Then it's like, you know, like Will Brody at Gold Coast. People, he's been linked at times to Carlton. One thing that always worries me about Will Brody is I think, well, who's in Gold Coast midfield? Why can't he play? Yeah. And I look at it and I'm like, well, aside from Matty Rao and maybe Anderson, yeah. it's not really crash hot. Like, I'd say Carlton's midfield is 10 times better than their midfield yeah. all day long. You have to say, of course. Yeah, that's it. So, like, to me, that's where I, I kind of like that. Like, it'd be nice for us to be in a situation two years' time that Cam Paulson's out of contract now. No one's going to trade for him. It'd be great to be in a position in two years' time that, say, Lockie O'Brien's there, but teams are going to be like, well, hang about. He's behind Williams, Cripps, yes. Walsh. Yeah. That, that's an all-star midfield. Yeah. Let's give a second rounder to him. Bit like yeah. Butler, you know, like people. Yes. I remember Butler when he was linked to us. There was Carlton fans going, "He's rubbish. He's yeah. trash." And my reply was, "Well, who's he behind? Like, exactly. he's behind the best small forward brigade yeah. in AFL." Yeah. Yeah. Like, like and it's he's tough to break in. Yeah, and he's proved that gone to St Kilda. How how good would he have been at Carlton this year? I mean. I, it's always, isn't it, a case that, you know, like, if only, as this my pop used to say, if only Nan had a wheel, she'd be a bike. Yeah, it's hard to look at if only. But for me, uh, I do think I watched him this year and I was like, God, imagine him. Yeah. Trust me, every time I watched him play, <laughs> I kept thinking, man, wasn't he in our door? Like, he had one foot in the door and then it just, like, disappeared, you know? It just, And I know... I know they were going for Pat Wynn, though, so they kind of stuffed up the field. I don't know what happened there, but I, I can understand why they come through. But anyway, that is what it is, so let's not worry about that big thing. Well, I thought in the Sauce interview, I always found that one intriguing when they asked him about that, and he, he, he was like, oh, well, we were so heavily into Papley and Betts. And that concerned me because then he went on to say Betts was more of a marketing ploy, that was why that was heavily pushed. They saw the backroom benefits. And then he also said Papley was tough to get done because it was so last minute. And it, when I went back and did the research, a week before draft trade period, we were linked with Butler. So I was thinking, what happened? Like, surely that would have been, it kind of intersected. Like, surely Papley was very early as well. It was about the same time. Surely... Like, for me, you would have thought there would be a contingency plan. And fair enough, Papley is ahead of Butler. But as soon as he started to realise, shit, this is going to be a mission, surely then you just get on the phone to Dan and say, come on down, son. 100%. And what's wrong with having Papley and Butler in the same side? What, what would have been wrong with that? <laughs> so, why didn't he do it? So, who knows? Who knows what goes behind that? Behind that? 
the doors there. Um, I just wanted to get off to something else, right, just quickly. Go on. Brownlow. Let's talk about the Brownlow just for a quick second, right? Yeah. Now, Patrick Cripps, right? What's with the jacket he was wearing? I, I just I don't get who wears a velvet jacket, mate. Like, what is going on? Could you see Luke Hodge wearing a jacket like that? I've I, I've got to say, it's funny you bring this up because it was something that I, I, I looked at it. My mate sent me the picture. And for those watching, here is the picture. My mate sent me that. And I straight away was like, what the hell is he wearing? Like, I've never seen, maybe coming from the north of England, 35, like sheltered life. I have never seen a velvet suit unless you're Frank Sinatra. I'm, I'm questioning... See, now I start to question, are the people around him giving him support? Because who lets him walk out like that? Like, who, who, if you, like, seriously, like, you know, when we go to the Brownlow this year, Palm, right? Because we're going to get invited. So when we go to the Brownlow, if you pick me up and you're wearing a velvet jacket, I'm going to take it off and I'm going to pound you with it, all right? And it's only for you, right? <laughs> so... I'm questioning that the people around him are giving him the support because why would you let him walk out like that, mate? Well, well you see, I'm with you. I'm, I'm a traditionalist. Like, I think the most risque I've ever gone is like a navy suit. <laughs> like, 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 and I consider myself quite posh having <laughs> the navy suit. You That's know what I mean? But um, I, I'm with you. I mean, my, my kids tell me it was cool. So I think I think for me as well, I've kind of resigned in the last couple of days that because daddy listens to Duran Duran and the Smiths and that's considered <laughs> old, maybe now I'm just old and I see a velvet suit and I'm like, not for me. Mate, right. the velvet suit will never be in fashion. I'm telling you now, unless you're Prince, right? You're not wearing a <laughs> velvet suit. So I'm just questioning... The leadership of the man. So let's hope that he can um, he can uh, fix that little problem. I, I'm with you, Rocco. I've got to say, for me, it's it, it, it's a standard bog standard suit for me. Mate, he should have been wearing just a black jacket, a black tie, mate. Just get out there, just do what you're gonna do. No velvet. Don't try to look pretty. You know what I mean? Like he outshone his girlfriend. That's you can't do that. Mate. He looked better than his girlfriend. I, you see. You see Actually, I was actually impressed with that though, because like it's quite hard to outshine a woman at a ball. I yeah. think a gala, like, like like I've been with my wife to many a ballroom function, and she always looks a million bucks, and I look like I've just been caught with my hand in the corner shop's drawer and about to do, about to be doing six months probation. Do you know what I mean? That's what you want, mate. You don't want to outshine your girlfriend. If you outshine your girlfriend, you maybe should be looking elsewhere. Look, not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with it. No, no, it's all good. And while we're there, just another thing I've got, Paddy Dow, right? Is it true there was a picture of him drinking a cocktail? Is this like Fanny? Yeah, it was on Instagram, I believe. It, I, I believe it was a Mai Tai. Oh, I can't believe it, man. Like, I don't understand, man. I don't understand who <laughs> goes around drinking cocktails. Like, is it? It's just ridiculous, mate. Like, how can you have any respect with a cocktail in your hand, mate? Like, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. What's going on, mate? It, it, it's tough to be taken seriously if you've got an umbrella in your drink, is my motto. <laughs> I agree, man. So, now, if I was opposition players, that, uh, that, that teacher, when, when I'm out there playing against them, I'll be bringing that up, mate. Like, seriously. Like, no, <laughs> you shouldn't be drinking cocktails, man. You shouldn't be drinking cocktails at all. It's just bloody ridiculous. What? What are we drinking there, Rocco? Oh, oh. No, no. Well, I'm probably I'm probably in that same boat as, as uh, Teddy Dow. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, to be fair, coming from the north of England, a cocktail to me is like if you're one of them weird people that puts lemonade in a beer. <laughs> That's right. The lemonade, the shandy. 
That's uh, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate of banning shandies worldwide. Yeah. Like, like in the north of England, like a shandy is what you give a kid. That's, like, that's, that's what we used to get as five-year-olds. Can I have some beer? Yeah, all right. And you used to put like lemonade in there, you know. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, I'll go to the bar and my kid will be sat with my wife and I'll tell him it's a full pint, but it's it. she, she sh it. the, the barmaid's shown the lemonade beer. That's all she's done. But you know what's just as you... bad? You know what's just as bad as the shandy? What? The apple cider. Now listen, apple ciders and pear ciders, just quietly, if you're drinking that, right, you pretty much not far behind the cocktail, man. Like, well, I've got, I've got to say, pear cider. <laughs> like, I tell me you like, drink the sandies. Coming from the north of England, like scrumpy, which is like a flat cider, yeah. I, I can get behind. I can get behind. It's a native to Somerset down south, really nice. But I've never been a fan of you know the fruit ciders. I don't like. I, I, I'm I, I'm still stuck in my ways. I find lager kind of almost like a soft drink because it's cold and fizzy like like i'm kind of miserable with my drinks as well i like them dark and miserable listen i'm telling you now i'd rather i'd rather stab myself in the eye than me seen with a bloody cider in my hand right so it's not gonna happen right the as far as the, the worst i'll go is i do like my corona with a little bit of lemon in there so i i I do that, you know, like that's about as far as I'll go, you know, as far as that. You've got a bit of class rocker, that's why. Yeah, mate, I'm full. A bit of sophistication. I'm full of class, mate, full of it. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to take Rocco out on a beer tasting tour. I, I went, uh, I, my wife took me to a beer tasting tour a couple of years ago and I, I was lost because I was stood next to a guy and the guy showing us and he's gone like, like he's swirling it round like it's wine and giving me the history of like, you know, the whole, how it was brewed and how the hops listened to Duran Duran for two years to help the growth and stuff. And like, I'm just there like. It's good wine. Well, it was, it was a beer tasting. So I'm like there like, so mate, while, this guy's, while this guy won't show up, do you want to just top me up? Like, <laughs> it's beer, man. Like, let's be serious. They do that with the wine too. You go to wine tasting, and they, and they, they shake it around, and then they have a sip, and then they spit it out. Right? And what's, what's the use? Of, and then they can tell you what year it was made. I'm thinking, mate, you, you need a girlfriend. <laughs> Uh, I, I always like watching the wine tastings, though, when you go around and someone stiffs it and they're like, oh, it takes me back to 1987. I'm listening to Glorious Summer. It smells like nightclub floors. And you're like, no, it doesn't. It smells like wine, mate. Like, <laughs> that's, it. that's it, mate. That's it. That's it. Oh, you, one day you're going to come over and I'm going to, uh, you're going to make the, because I make the wine every year. So one day you're going to come over and we're going to make the wine together. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to you telling me what it smells of and stuff, and, <laughs> and, and me being the uncultured heathen guy. Tastes like wine, mate. That's it. I love it. Loving it. Loving it. All right. Well, that is us done. We'll be back next time. If you can put in the comments some yeah. subjects you want us to cover, me and Rocco yep. are easy. Yep, definitely. Like put in something, uh, anything. Even uh, we'll probably go over maybe particular event in history maybe a particular game we can go over or you know something that's happened in, in previous uh, years maybe we can talk a bit about that so anything that that you guys want yeah let us know and we will give our expert knowledge on on this and we'll try to save the world as we're doing now yeah well, I mean, we've already started to be hypocrites. We had you on a show with the cocktail just then. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I predict by 2021, we're presenting this in a velvet suit with my ties each. Looking forward to it. That's it. Exactly right, man. It's been a pleasure, buddy. Loving this. And, uh, yeah, uh, look forward to the next one. Yeah, I look forward to it. We'll see you all soon. Hey!